Welcome to COIQ, a first-of-its-kind video program about health innovators, early adopters, and influencers, and their stories about riding the roller coaster of healthcare innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy, founder of Legacy DNA Marketing Group, and it's time to raise our COIQ. Welcome back to the show, COIQ listeners. On today's episode, we have Kamon Angelitas with us. He is the CEO and founder of Vivante Health, and you may know him more by his um, work with Lavongo. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, actually, Dr. Roxy. It's fun. I like uh, enjoy being here. Thanks very much. So I am really excited to have this conversation with you and dig into your story. Um, before we get started, though, uh, just t- for those folks that maybe don't know who you are, start off by telling our listeners a little bit about your background and what it is that you do. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, that's always a hard part. Yeah. What, what do you say about yourself? But um, actually, I'm originally uh, trained as a scientist, and so uh, and, and many of the things that I've done uh, to date, I, I think like a scientist. And so um, I really am a, a biophysicist. Uh, so I have a PhD in organic chemistry and biophysics. Um, I was an academician for, I was on faculties for a long time of my career, probably 20, 25 years before I even went into business. And so I was a professor. Um, and so uh, it was probably in uh, 2000 and 2004 when I guess I got the bug essentially to uh, to start thinking about uh, building something or creating something outside of academics. And so, um, my first uh, first business was obviously something that I was familiar with. It was biotech, um, and it was a collaboration between uh, MD Anderson and uh, GlaxoSmithKline and Valiant Pharmaceuticals. And the objective there was to uh, uh, to uh, make a drug that actually was uh, helping people with malignant melanoma, which is a big issue here in Texas where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Um, the second one, um, the second one is uh, my wife, who's a pediatric endocrinologist. We thought that there was a real unmet need in, in, in people who had diabetes. Um, so we set up a network called Diabetes America, which was a one-stop shop for folks who had diabetes. And we had, uh, oh, I think all the way up to 40 or 50 centers um, throughout the Southwest. And then um, uh, in terms of what I did afterwards, and this was in 2008, 2009, I formed this company, which was EOS Health, which really became Lavongo, was renamed Lavongo. Um, and that was really to be able to use technology to, to provide a service in diabetes for people who uh, were geographically distributed, that they were all over the country instead of having come to our clinics. And so um, that's kind of the oddest thing. So I was an academician for a long time doing bio, biophysics, looking through a microscope most of the day, which I liked. And then uh, it morphed into uh, trying to do what you would call population health and using technology to, uh, uh, to expand. And then Vivante Health is, is, is a company that is really focusing on uh, the unmet needs of people who fall between the cracks, uh, who have diseases that no one really believes that they have. They don't look sick. They're just crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, cry. they're crazy, but <laughs> they're, they're, they're crazy to find something that will help them, actually. In the right, end. right. <laughs> and so uh, we started with digestive conditions because that's a big, big deal, and no one really wants to talk about uh, their digestive problems. So that's, uh, that's kind of the odyssey. Yeah, yeah. So describe what it is like for someone who has founded several companies, which, you know, there are many several uh, serial entrepreneurs out there. But I think what makes your story unique is that you um, have been a pioneer in digital health and then successfully commercialized an innovation in healthcare. Really, you've beaten the odds. (laughs) Well, 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 thanks, actually. I appreciate that. And so pioneer is not something that I like to think about. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, you know, I mean, being an entrepreneur is uh, there's a lot of risk, uh, although I don't actually look at it as, as a risk profile, but I look at it as a challenge. I think, you know, I'm, I'm generally pretty optimistic. And so if you if you actually start with the right problem and the right approach, and, and I'll tell you about why I think, uh, you know, in terms of digital health, if you if you start from the right from the right grounding, um, then, um, then, then really you, you actually have a story and you can build uh, the technology around the solution. And so, you know, really the, the long and short of it is, is that uh, we knew the clinical problem, right? 
Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so, so, so the clinical problem actually affected people or affects people, diabetes or whether it's digestive conditions. And so, you know, technology is kind of a tool, really, um, to be able to, to bring all those resources that people need together, right? And if, you know, if they need to have some nutrition, they need to actually have some other coaching. Technology is, allows it to, to, be, uh, to be brought together. And so mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of where we may have been successful or been successful is to really focus first on the clinical problem and then to bring as many sort of techniques like technology together to be able to address it. And so uh, we've always been clinically focused. Um, you know, oftentimes, and last thing I'll say on this, that oftentimes is that in digital health, um, you know, uh, people start from the tech, the tech, the tech space, right? And they, yeah. and they think that healthcare is like any other type of consumer business. And, and to a certain degree, it is. But, um, you know, you're, you're talking about a, just a vast variety of personalities and conditions and things like that. And so healthcare is really a bit different. So that, that's really, I think, the, the key is, is focusing on the clinical problem. So I... You're probably one of those guys that just had, you know, born with all the knowledge and resources that you needed to just breeze through entrepreneurship, you know, with these four companies, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was easy. That was, you know, it's sort of like the royal family had been, you know, being, being held something right there and having a trust fund and all that type of right, stuff. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to go back in time a, a, a little sure. bit. So think back to the real early days of one of your first companies. Yeah. Um, you know, what was it like building that first company? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's just one word. It was, it was crazy. Totally, totally crazy. Um, but we were crazy enough, actually, when, I, when I, we started with MD Anderson, um, and then I'll talk about the digital health, but yeah, yeah. crazy enough to, to, to be able to somehow convince MD Anderson that it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think in large part, I think in large part is because it was a good, it, it, it was a good clinical problem, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, and, and just to sort of sidetrack, I think you'd find this interesting is, is that, you know, um, people who have cancer, for example, um, they, they, they do make antibodies, their immune system actually starts to react to this, this bad stuff in their body. So we pose the question, well, if they're doing that early enough, right? Um, you know, they're trying to kill those cancer cells off. Why can't we actually isolate those, the really good antibodies, you know, that ultimately get overwhelmed by the, you know, the cancer cells. Why can't we just try to see if we can harvest those and bulk them up and grow them up and use them as, as a therapy. And so, uh, you know, the first question and the first answer that even in digital health, well, that can't be done. Um, that's kind of a fun thing to say, well, let's try, right? Yep, yep. Um, and then, and I'm, then I'm crazy know. enough to try it. <laughs> yeah, I'm crazy enough to try it, and it's my time and not necessarily yours. And so, right. And then the same thing with the digital health. I remember when we first used mobile phones uh, in, in our diabetes clinics, um, the, they were these, and I've kept them all, they were these bar phones. Motorola came out with a bar phone with a little tiny screen. There wasn't any app store, so it was in 2005, 2006. Yep. And we said, well, let's, you know, maybe we'll use mobile phones actually to be able to do sort of healthcare, you know, diabetes, look at numbers and all that and say, oh, that won't work. Um, so <laughs> let me show you it'll work. And uh, in the end, it, it did. And so uh, um, I think the first word there is crazy. And then yeah. the second is, let me show you. And, um, you know, there's, uh, it, it goes on. Then you get, and then you get trapped and you're, you're doing it. Right, right. <laughs> and then you're addicted to it. And then you're like four companies in. <laughs> four companies in. You've got followers, right? Yeah. Um, you're leading and you've got followers. And, and, and actually, uh, you know, they start to, to get engaged. And so there you, there you find yourself with. Uh, and, 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 the, and, and the thing on that, to be, to be quite frank with you, is, is that if it really was purely a technology, then basically your followers are only as good as the sort of technology. But if you have a really good clinical problem, mm -hmm. um, there are lots of ways to sort of get around that clinical problem. And so um, I've been lucky in that respect. You get these followers and they got good brains and, they, and we eventually solve it. 
And so are your followers meaning like the team that you work with? Yeah, and you know, followers. I mean, you know, you're, you're, cra- you're, you're the first crazy one and, and then you have the second person who comes on and then a third and then it actually becomes a group. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> of, of, of crazy people. <laughs> Okay, so for all of our listeners, the prerequisite for market success is a dash of crazy, maybe even a little more than a dash. <laughs> with a lot of passion, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Dash definitely. Of crazy, a dash of crazy with, with a lot of passion, and it goes a long way. It's 90, you know, there are a lot of smart people out there, by the way, but if they don't have fire in their belly, by the way, and things like that, um, it doesn't go that far. Right, right. Yeah, of, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, to your point, it's that crazy that allows you to think about, believe that you can do the, what, what people are saying can't be done right. and, and the passion to be the fuel to, you know, stand back up again when you've been knocked down a hundred times. Totally, right? totally right. Absolutely. Totally right. And it's, um, you know, um, yeah, it, that's actually totally right. It's, uh, you know, the, the passion gets you because you, you, you need to do it. You, you feel it inside that you need to do it and that you can do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, those are the, the, the two essential ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> so what, from your perspective, what makes commercializing and innovation in healthcare so difficult? Yeah, you know, um, uh, and I appreciate that question. And 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 you know, um, so 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 healthcare is is obviously unusual. In the, and when we're talking about digital healthcare, it's unusual in the fact that um, it's it's easy or easier to see how you can commercialize digitized banking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because because you don't have to essentially when healthcare, you don't really have to essentially undress, right, and tell your story. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're, you're, you know, so you're at a disadvantage when you go into healthcare because there you are in one of these floppy gowns, right? And you're telling your story and you're <laughs> really, you know, it's not your natural environment, right? Vulnerable. Yeah, you're, you're vulnerable. So, so I, I think the key right here is, is really to take out that vulnerability, if you will, right? Is, is to, to, to make it as personal as you can or personalized as you can, right? So mm-hmm. that you can address that healthcare problem, right, and and get rid of that vulnerability, so that you're you're really on equal footing with the people. So that, as we find out, actually interesting, and I'll get to the commercialization, is that people are willing to tell you a lot more about themselves, just like on social media, um, when when you when you level the the playing field. Mm-hmm. Um, so so given that, that's one aspect. The the second aspect is, and I'll go back to the clinical problem in terms of commercialization. You know. Again, there's lots of technology out there, Roxy. There's just lots of technology out there. Sure. But if you don't have a, if you don't really have a a, a problem that's uh, that's of sufficient magnitude um, and and passion, essentially, um, then it's just going to sort of sit there as a as a technology. And you know, it might be acquired, but it doesn't really do anybody good. So, um, you know, the commercialization is, always comes with a good with a with a good product and a and a and a and a, and a good clinical. Uh, good clinical solution. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that's for uh, foremost, in my opinion. So I'm going to just jump right in um, and, and you can kind of envision yourself um, naked and afraid with your hospital gown, because I'm going to get vulnerable really quick. <laughs> what are some of the mistakes, you know, if we're just being really honest here, just me and yeah. you and a few thousand listeners, oh, yeah. <laughs> what are some of the mistakes that you can look back and see oh, that yeah. you made along the way that you would want to share with others so that they can kind of be on the lookout for them or make sure that they don't make yeah. those same mistakes? Yeah, that's an easy one, and, and I, it's an easy one uh, because I made plenty of them, and I, I won't go down the list. But it, you know, for for a lot of the a lot of the folks out there, actually, and a lot of the uh, I would say younger people who are starting in the in the area. Um, so you have a great you have a great solution. You have a great program. You have a product, for example. It's gotten some exposure and all of that. So that's mm-hmm. that's cool, right? You feel really good. I've got some traction. So then a big, uh, a big dog comes up, uh, like a big health plan, for example, and they say, I really like what you're doing, and we would really like to, to begin uh, distributing your solution, okay? So you're a, 
a little itty bitty sort of startup. You might have 10 to 15 or 20 people, right? Yeah. Your eyes go really big and you say, that's so cool. We're, we're so recognized. And then what happened? Yeah, you know, you know, all the crazies go, see, see, we weren't crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what happens is, is, is that now you're on, you have quite of a, a tailwind. Mm -hmm. but it's like a tornado. You can't keep up with what, what they do. You know, you're, you're sucked into the vortex of a large company that yep. moves incredibly slowly, that has a totally different culture than you do. And now you're going from one of the customer to the other customer, to the other customer, and you're building up. Um, in some cases, they use it as a sales mechanism, right? So it, it, it benefits them, but really it doesn't benefit you in terms of developing a product and or, or, or your revenue line. So mm -hmm. I've done that. I won't tell you who the, the, the oh. health plans are. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, and so we said, this is super cool. And we almost died, actually, yeah. um, trying to service those accounts. So I would tell everybody out there is that it really looks good, but you've got to be very careful on the accounts that you do um, because yeah. you, you, you take all of them, right? You know, you're starting, you take all of them. Well, and especially if it's a big, reputable company, you know, you kind of get woo-woo, like, oh my gosh, this is, this is it. This is the only deal we need. And now, like, yeah. success is there right around the corner. And, you, and you're, totally, you're toast at that point. You really yeah. are toast because you can't keep up with it. Um, they're not looking out for you in terms of developing your product. Your revenue line doesn't increase the way that you think it, it is. Uh, your expense line goes way up. Yes. Your, people are, your people are frazzled and they say, well, crazy was one thing, but craziest is really not so good. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard many stories about that being a death trap. It is totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. So that's, I think, the probably the biggest mistake in, in, in the area. Um, and, and, you know, and I think the second thing is um, everybody thinks that uh, uh, that they have the most beautiful product and stuff. And sometimes you just got to step back and you got to say, is it really good looking or good? Is it ugly? Or, you know, and you say, you know, if it's ugly, then let's pivot. But you sometimes you just got to say this just is not going to go. Right. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Those biases that I think we all have as entrepreneurs and innovators, um, you know, to create something and be really more inclined to find people to agree and validate what we've created totally. and st instead of give us the truth that we really need to hear in order to be successful. Right. You hit it exactly correct. It's actually trying to get the truth out of your quote followers and your team mm -hmm. uh, so that you have a realistic approach and, and you're not doing a nosedive uh, when you think that you're climbing. So yeah, mm -hmm. you're exactly correct. You're exactly correct. So, so what were, again, kind of doing this look back, um, you know, what were some of those game changing decisions for you? Maybe something that was a surprise or wasn't, but something where, you know, maybe you made this one decision and you, you know, you thought it was a good decision, but you didn't realize that it was going to be such a game changer. And yeah. so maybe it was a, a customer, maybe it was a message, maybe it was a team member. Um, you know, there's a whole host of examples that you could share with us, um, but maybe one or two of your uh, big yeah. changing stories. Um, you know, um, I think after, you know, I think after trying to, to realize that not all customers are equal, that's, that's one thing. That's a big re realization. I think, I think the other thing too uh, is um, if you're in a decent area and you're a good area, right. And it's a good problem, you're going to have competition, right? Yeah. So, so, and, and that's good, by the way. Um, if, if you have competition, sometimes people say, oh, gosh, I've got competition and we're better than these folks or we don't have competition. It's a wide open field. So we're really good. We got a green field uh, type of thing. Um, I remember when um, I remember early on when Qualcomm put 90 million dollars into a competitor. Mm. Oh, we, that's a scary moment. Yeah, we were we were taking a nosedive then. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I was dipping into every personal thing that I that, that we had actually to sure. uh, to to sell basically. So I said, you know, um, you know, here's a competitor has ninety million dollars, and you know, this is this is a this is a tough one. Um, but that was actually a good thing in the end. It really was because we we I stepped back a little bit and I said, you know, 
that what are they putting $90 million into and do they understand it? And, and we sort of reevaluated it at that point. And so that really was a pivotal point where, uh, you know, although we were kind of second, if you will, um, you know, uh, that gave us an opportunity to sort of redesign some things and it just like skyrocketed after that. So the $90 million really didn't make a difference at all. I think we did much more on, you know, I don't know, 400,000. And so I think, I think that was a game changer is that sort of, um, you know, think about competition, but, but that's not, that's not where it ends really. Um, so let's kind of dive into that a little bit. Cause I think that's a really powerful story. I want to understand the situation. So was it that you hadn't gone to market and you saw this investment and you saw what they were doing and you were able to make your mark with the gaps that they weren't filling or were you already in the market and it helped you pivot? Yeah, uh, in, in, in essence, it was really kind of the second one. So, so, so here's, here's really the story. Um, w- one of the things that Livongo has, it has a cellular meter, essentially, and, and, and then I'll tell you, um, at, that, at that particular point, it had a cellular meter that we put a, a SIM card in, just like a phone, mm-hmm. and we had, already, we, we had already really developed it um, and had prototyped it, and we knew it was going to work. I went from the Bluetooth devices and things like that because people – you know, could measure their blood glucose on their meter and it would go over to their phone and then it would go up to, you know, it'd go to a server and all that. Yep. And so we, we said we wanted to make that experience a little bit easier. So I started building a cellular, a cellular meter. Well, because Qualcomm is in the phone business and the radio type of business, they said, oh, um, and Paul Jacobs, actually, his, his family had, had diabetes. So he said, I'll throw my $90 million um, to do something very similar. And I'm not sure whether he, they did it actually to quash us because they had seen us. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So um, we uh, we were kind of already in the market. We had already uh, had some customers. Uh, we were we were reeling from the customers we had. We had this great piece of technology that we were going to roll out. We were <laughs> down to our last pennies, and bingo, ninety million dollars. He said, "Well, God, what the heck are we going to do here?" Oh my that? goodness. Uh, <laughs> And so we, swim. yeah, we, we took a step back and we said, okay, um, this is what we need to think about and how we need to think about it. It's not technology. We're trying to address a clinical problem and, and a consumer ease problem. And, and that made, that made all the difference. We, we, we redesigned it. We made it touchscreen. We made it colorful. Um, uh, we, we did a variety of different things. And so it, it was, it was a good moment. Um, I look back on it as kind of a, a pivot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is there, so when you think about the, the companies that you built before Lavongo, were there like some specific strategies or tactics that you implemented at Lavongo, um, that you had learned from the past? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did. You know, when, when the, the diabetes company and the way that I think about Vivante Health now too is um, because we, we'd been in the clinical business. We had clinics, so people would actually come in and it was a full service. They would, be mm-hmm. able to, they would be able to get everything they needed for diabetes and stuff. So I insisted on no white coats, first of all. And we had a large room there so doctors could mingle and talk with, with, with uh, patients or people. We never called them really patients. Yep. So, and so, so um, we wanted to sort of buck the traditional hierarchical mode where the doctor is here and the patient is here and, and MD, you know, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, all of these, these, uh, uh, these services where you can get, you know, education and do dumps for, for information that tries to get you up here. But, but so, so what we wanted to do is put, you know, physicians, for example, and people on the same, on the same, on the same level. Mm-hmm. And, and so that was in Diabetes America. And that's what I really wanted to do actually in Livongo. And that's what I want to do in Vivante. And, and Vivante, getting back to that, is, is even a, a, a bigger difference right here is that people who've got digestive conditions, whether it's irritable bowel syndrome, you know, which is really prevalent in, in females, you know, they'll go to their doctor and they'll say, you know, I'm, 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 I, I have diarrhea all the time. I have bloating all the time. And, 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 and so then they'll get scoped, right? And the doctor yeah. will say, I see nothing wrong. Um, and they say, well, it's in your head. So yep. <laughs> immediately there's an asymmetry there. The doctor says, you know, I, you know there's nothing wrong with you, right? It's in mm-hmm. your head. Mm-hmm. Um, but the user or the person essentially says, I feel terrible. Right. You know? And I feel terrible all the time. And I know it's not in my head. So, 
what we tried to do here is is actually raise it such that you know that those two individuals are going to be the same in other words let's give credibility to the user or to the patient yeah their issues are you know are truly real um and then make sure we take that sort of realness mm -hmm. and give it to the doctors to show how real it is essentially so that you know they get engaged in that too so the long and mm -hmm. short of it is is that i think we're able to do that is to sort of level set even using technology in, in, in our approach. So that's kind of kind of sort of the, the, the theory behind it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that, that's really good. So let's talk about the strategies that you use for either Livongo or the ones that you've already, you know, uh, implemented for Vivante Health. Um, you know, some of the basics of your commercialization plan. How did you define what was going to be your beachhead market. So I know that you're saying that you started with a problem, um, but you know, as I've worked with innovators, sometimes their problem, the, the problem that they're solving, um, there could be several markets or sure. um, customer groups that are experiencing that problem. How did you narrow down what was going to be your beachhead market? Well, so, so, so that's probably an easier one um, in, in the sense that even with Diabetes America and Livongo, um, with, with Diabetes America, we did something very special there. Um, we we thought we were really pretty good, um, and so we had all the care that you know that people could use, and it contained it and all the data, so that we wouldn't do duplications and things. So that allowed us an opportunity to go to health plans, and it allowed us to go to large employers because they pay mm -hmm. their own bill, self-funded yep. employers, and to do carve outs so that we say, okay, we're going to take some risk here, right? We think we're that good. And so, you know, your cost might be 7000 um, for each person who has diabetes. And we're going to do it and we're going to cap it at 3500 uh, $3, okay? They like that because they're self-funded and they're public entities. And so they, mm -hmm. they know exactly where they're going to be. Yep. Um, I did that with Ovongo as well. I, I used a method whereby actually, you know, um, getting strips and the meter and all that was bundled in one, in one, in one area so that it was a single price. And that single price for all those services was the same price as uh, you would buy for testing strips. So it was, uh, you get all this other stuff essentially and you bundle it. Um, so the cost uh, uh, would be equivalent to just buying the, the supply. So, so the self-funded market, the guys, the guys who actually pay for the healthcare like that model because either we took risk um, or we took, uh, uh, or we made it sort of equivalent and we added a lot more value. And the same thing with Vivante, though, here, too, uh, uh, as it turns out, is that we're going to self-funded employers. Now, the difference, the self-funded employers and health plans, but the difference is here with Vivante and Digestive is that while employers have wellness programs and they have diabetes programs and they have musculoskeletal programs, behavioral health, they had nothing for digestive health programs, okay? Yeah. There's nothing that existed there. So um, we, we were able to, to go to self-funded employers, but as it turns out, um, for digestive conditions, there's a huge pharma component as well. In other words, you can just turn on the TV right now and see advertisements for Humira, uh, Stellara, you know, ulcerative mm -hmm. colitis, all of yep. that. So, so the, the other market that allowed us to look at was pharma. And... And so our thesis, and, and I'll finish here on this, the, the thesis was, you know, these are really expensive drugs, right? They're, they yep. cost about fifty or $60,000 a year. The, the employer is, is paying for those, right, for someone who's on it. The person who's getting these drugs is getting no extra value except a drug, right? Yep. <clears throat> so we said, let's just do a wrap around these things. Why not? Why not, you know, go beyond what the molecule is? Let's have a service that accompanies it so that you have actually the full spectrum. Some people uh, are going to need more of the drug. Some people are going to need less of the drug. Some people are not going to be on the drug. But they're going to have a program that's going to be sort of goes along with it that's going to educate them and going to help them at like an adjuvant therapy. Does that make sense? So, oh, yeah, yeah. We have a whole pharma, we have a whole pharma place right here where we can actually add value to beyond the molecule. So that's something that's very different. Those are the channels that we're looking at. So did you, have you, or are you in the process of doing like a strategic partnership with a pharma company and that be part of your go-to-market strategy? Yes, we, we just finished a strategic partnership with a 
very, very large pharma. Um, mm -hmm. It will be announced in the next couple of weeks. Yep. Um, and uh, it's exceedingly exciting um, for us. Um, as it turns out, um, people who are on these, uh, these expensive drugs, um, actually they only work in one in four, one in five people. And so um, there is the opportunity to be able to, um, to match the right people from the very beginning and then those people who are on them where they've lost their response to be able to change them on to another therapy, therapy like nutrition, part of our program, mm -hmm. and actually uh, start to heal their gut um, and, uh, and, and get them off of the drugs for a little bit of time. So um, it's a, a new direction for pharma um, and it's a, it's a great direction for us too. So I'm exci I'm super excited about that. So how much of this do you think plays a part in, in your success with both Lavongo and, you know, already with Vivante? Because what I hear from you is that self-insured employer groups were part of that beachhead market for both right. companies. And, you know, I think that that is... Um, it's not necessarily unique, but it's very no. powerful because there are so many other companies that are going the traditional healthcare route that seem to be just kind of pounding the pavement, knocking on doors and banging their head up against the wall because of all the bureaucracy, because of the time that it takes for that sales cycle. And, you know, going to the self-insured employers certainly has a lot of advantages right. um, to, be, to, to overcome some of those obstacles of the traditional path. Right. Well, you know, um, when we first started with the self-funded employers, it was as early as 2004. Yep. I went to them in, in 2008 again for Livongo, um, uh, and, and, and that was new. Um, I, I was at a, a recent meeting um, at, a, uh, at a recent meeting with uh, uh, 50, 60 employers, and someone commented that, that the uh, flea to dog ratio is pretty high um, <laughs> these days. But the flea to dog ratio was not so high. So, you know, if you have, and, and that gets back to one of your original questions, if, it, if, you, if you have a solution or you think you have something that's technology-based, there's a lot about them. And there are a lot of vendors uh, circling these, these employers. But if there's really a void and a need and you can actually show that it's a big ticket expense item, like, you know, like digestive conditions, um, it's actually within, you know, they never realized this when we started looking at their claims, it's within the top five, um, of all of their, their, uh, their expenses. And so once you point out that problem essentially, and, and you have a solution that doesn't cost them any extra money and can save them some money, um, then, then, then you're, then you're in. Now, if you have a diabetes program or you have a pre-diabetes program or an exercise program, it's a little tougher. There's mm -hmm, a lot of, mm -hmm. You, can't, yeah. you don't really know where the ROI is there, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing that sounds really different is, you know, like the, the business model component of, of bundling. Yeah. Uh, you know, so was, so as you, when you talk about the fleet of dog ratio, right, there's this explosion of innovation. And so, you know, there's innovation in, in all industries, but it just feels like it's a lot more concentrated yeah. in healthcare. Yeah. And, you know, if you're trying to sell your wares to someone, you know, instead of maybe someone else this month pinching a competing or substitute solution, they might have had three just in the last hour, right? right. So yeah. it's so, so saturated with innovation. So I wonder, um, you know, were you with this bundled approach? Was that part of how you were able to rise above the noise? Um, or was it something else? Yeah, in, in part, in part, by the way, so, so, so the bundled approach or any approach, you know, if you think that you're, if, if you think you have a good solution, you shouldn't be afraid to take some risk, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, there, and, and there's some successful companies out there that are beginning to take risk. You know, you got to put your money where your mouth is in that respect, I think. Yep. So, um, and, and then you brought up an interesting point. You say there's an explosion of innovation. Um, it might look like it on the surface, as it turns out. There, there's a lot of variation of the same theme. Yep, yep. And so I wouldn't necessarily call it innovation. Um, and, and, and so, you know, bringing another disease management program, whether it's digestive disease, uh, you know, um, I wouldn't call an in innovation in itself at all. I really wouldn't. Okay. Um, just, you know, that's even our program. I wouldn't call it innovative in that respect, but I would say that the components that it brings essentially and the things that it'll reveal are things uh, and information that we would never learned 
not only about digestive conditions, but about all sort of chronic conditions that haven't been addressed and about pharma. So there's components in, of this essentially, which, um, you know, are, are new learning experiences. And so, um, you know, um, a lot of them right now are just throwing, you know, throwing sort of uh, solutions they're calling innovative, um, but they're not that well thought out. I, I don't mean to be, you know, throw water on it, cold water on it, but. So what's missing? Because I think that's, again, I think you, you know, you continue to hit on these golden nuggets that I think are going to be really, really valuable to our listeners. What, what, when, when you're kind of talking about people that are throwing stuff at the wall, that's really not re- innovative, what are they missing and, and what do they need to build into it in order to really have something of value? Well, okay, so that's easy. I mean, to be honest with you, it's easy. It, it's the person and the outcome. I mean, look, mm-hmm. if you, you know, you're 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 a person who has a particular illness, right? I mean, I, I, why 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 throw technology? I mean, you know, we're just we're just so heavily laden with technology, right? Yeah. I don't call that, and, and they call it engagement. You know, these folks, folks who uh, who have a chronic condition, want to be less engaged with their 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 illness, right? I mean, you yeah. don't. Wanna, you don't want to be thinking about you know sick all the time, right? So it's a flip side of that. You know what can you do to have them feel like they're less engaged with having to think about you know being sick or doing this or having diabetes and all that type of stuff. So um, that's the that's part of the problem is is that you know if you throw some technology or you throw a solution that's that's got a lot of technology and you don't think about how burden the individual is with technology, I mean, how do you expect them to be more engaged with an illness they don't want anyway? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I think that's the, that's part of the issue, right? You know, I mean, there's companies that are measuring your feelings and they're doing this and they're, you know, they're after the feelings, they want you to go see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why create, why create a problem when, you know, so, I think that's the problem. You, you know, you can throw a lot of this stuff out, hope something sticks, hope somebody has a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you talked about leveling the playing field between, you know, the physicians or the clinicians in the patients or people that have our users or have the condition. Uh, have you a ad- adapted, adopted any strategies into your uh, product management or product development where you were involving them in the process oh, all the of time. building out. So let's talk about that a little bit. All, all the time, you know, um, and, and actually you bring up a good point because, um, you know, there, there's a, there's two schools of thoughts. I think even, even uh, Apple did that, you know, consumers don't know what they want, right? So we're just going to build it. And, and in some cases we've done that. Yep. Um, and more recent with Vivante, actually, we have a, when we first went into it, I didn't know this area. We, uh, it, it was, it, it just, it was astounding. I didn't know much about social media, but we tested out the social media. Um, the pictures that we got back from people who've had uh, digestive conditions, whether it's IBS and they've had that constant diarrhea or people who have constipation, it was an interesting outlet to see the pictures and the social media that we got back. It was, you know. Um, You're like, surely they're not going to want to publicize that, but they totally are, right? <laughs> they are, actually. And so, so, so that actually was a key is, you know, you ask yourself, you know, um, for people who don't have sort of conditions like this, we're not leaving, you know, living like this all the time. Um, how willing are you to share actually, you know, your poop pictures or <laughs> toilet pictures, right? Yeah. But if you're living with a condition essentially like this. This is just part of your, you know, your, your normal life. So um, we have those user groups all the time. We test the products out there. They tell us, so oh, this is useful. This is really garbage. Um, you know, this is, you know, how we feel. Um, a lot of the people in our company, actually, and I won't say I hire for it, that might um, actually have these chronic digestive conditions. And so that's also an important component. So, 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 so we do testing and there are mm-hmm. people like us who've got these conditions. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really important too, because, you know, I think traditionally a lot of companies innovated internally and and felt a a sense of responsibility to come up with all of the innovative ideas within the company and have something kind of complete to bring to market. And that's when customers or prospects were involved in any process of like, hey, here's it, here, here it is. Do you want to use it or do you want to buy it? Whereas there's definitely over the last 
last couple of decades in other industries. And I'm starting to see a little bit more of this in healthcare. We're just scratching the surface of, I don't have to be the expert internally. Yeah. I just need to be able to ask the right questions and, and, and allow those prospective customers to be a part of that product innovation process. Totally. And like, wow, I mean, you know, your R and D costs go down and your success rates go up. So it's a win yeah. win, yeah. but you kind of have to put your ego to the side totally. that says, I don't have to have all the answers, <laughs> you know, you're totally, you're totally, you're totally right. Um, you know, uh, you know, people don't all, I mean, if you crowdsource it type of thing, they don't always know. Um, but, but, you know, um, there's some commonality. You're, you're, you're hundred percent, you're hundred percent right. That's exactly correct. And so luckily, actually, um, I'd say our product development is, um, and, and this is not meant to, is run by women. Um, and, um, and, and they get it. I, I, yeah. I, they, they, they get it. <laughs> you know, the ego aside, at least the, the folks we have, they're extremely good and mm -hmm. they're open up. Um, and I mean, they just get it. The, there's a sensitivity there that I, we just don't have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you know, we, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that, you know, companies are comprised of people and, you know, strategies, products, every processes, everything kind of begins and ends with the team. If you don't have the right team, you know, you're not going to have a successful company. Um, one of the things that I noted that was really interesting about you and Vivante Health is I would say that you are a younger company, right? Vivante's only been yeah. around for a couple of years yeah. and you already have a chief commercial officer. We do. We've hired actually of our C-suite. Um, mm -hmm. So we have some really uh, great new hires. Um, yeah, Bill Snyder came from Verta Health. He's absolutely spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, he's a vigorous young guy who's got a great track record, and um, he's done he's done marvelous. He's built a great team for us. I have Catherine Moore, who's the chief product officer. Um, she came from Zocdoc and then Guild Education. She's got mm -hmm. it so far together that. Um, and uh, she's extremely good. We just hired two uh, two new people on the C suite, uh, and then there's Andy Loving, I should say, who came, who's in Nashville, who was with Naris Health and Aspire and, and Healthways, a, a really a seasoned veteran. Um, and we just hired two new people. Our chief technology officer is uh, Deborah Ann Braun. Uh, she came from HP and United Healthcare. She's absolutely terrific. Um, yeah, yeah. And our chief medical officer, uh, uh, who will be coming on in a couple of weeks, is uh, uh, Simon Matthews. Um, he's a GI doctor from Hopkins. He was on the faculty of Hopkins, and he decided to join us. So I've got a really a terrific young uh, young team um, that are passionate and uh, and uh, uh, have all those ingredients. So uh, I've been really lucky um, with this team. Super lucky. So what do you say to those health innovators that, you know, only, obviously, all of us only have a certain amount of resources to work with, and you're making the decision of, you know, obviously, the C-suite is, is expensive, you know, or more expensive than, you know, let's get some interns, right? So it's two completely different mindsets for a leader of a company. Um, and you've got a, a limited amount of money to work with. And right. you need to invest in the product, you need to invest in your go to market, but you need to invest in the team that's going to help you with all of sure. that. So sure. what do you say to innovators that are, you know, kind of on the teeter totter between human capital yeah. Technology, go to market. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, I think um, I, this, uh, I hope this will sound, I'm, I'm really lucky. I have, I, I've, I've had a pretty broad background and I think being trained as a scientist has allowed me to, to do each and every one of these tasks. So first of all, I know what each and every one of them entails, right? You can't hire somebody and say, and not have had that experience. And I, I never do that. So I always do things first myself. Yep. Yeah. And, and so, so that's kind of number one. And so um, when you hire people, then you have a better sort of um, understanding of what you need in that individual. Right. And, and quite frankly, when, um, when, when, when you start talking with folks and you start to bring on, on these folks, there's two elements. I'm a little older in this respect. One is trying to, to, to have the, their careers grow. Right. I think the best accolade is to, and I really do, is to train them so well that they want to leave, but yep. not have them leave. 
And so um, I, I always start out doing all of the stuff myself. And um, as a team gets bigger, they say, why are you doing anything? We don't want you to do anything. You're just interfering. Um, <laughs> that's, that's how it grows, you know, and yeah, you, start yeah. to get the, you start to get those people. And, and it comes down to a sort of a, what I would call a cultural thing. You know, you said they're expensive in the C-suite. Well, um, people want to work primarily at places where they're valued and they can grow their careers, right? And, 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 and have that freedom and experiment. So um, I don't really go for the highest dollar. I won't do that. I mean, right, that's, right. That's, that, but, um, and I want them all to be shareholders. So we're generous on that because mm-hmm. if we row the same direction, we all uh, profit from that same direction. So um, sure. I've been really lucky in getting people who have the right chemistry. They have the right passion. Um, they have good experience. Um, and my job is simply to, um, to, to try to see if I can develop their careers, um, you know, um, further. Um, mm-hmm. so that's what I'm supposed to be doing uh, and, and carrying the vision of the company. But um, so uh, for the other entrepreneurs, well, do all of it for yourself and then, you know, slowly add. But you don't have to buy really expensive people because you think they're, quote, experienced, right? Yep, yep. Um, it's a matter of people who've got fire in their belly and are willing to learn new things. Um, mm-hmm. So that, that's how I look at it. Well, and I couldn't agree with you more. The fire in the belly is just so important, right? Because again, yep. as a startup company, there's just so many challenges. And so you've got to be able to be resilient um, oh. and, and keep that fire in the belly. Oh. Um, you know, not everybody is going to be so uh, such high risk takers, right. <laughs> but there's a big reward at the end of it, right? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. And, and you actually can see your vision actually getting laid out on a daily basis. And that's kind of cool because... You know, every little thing you do, you know, you've done it yourself. And so that's pretty cool. You can see the advancement. So um, as we wrap up here, is there anything else that you, um, you know, kind of think about it for just a second? Is there anything else that you would want to share with fellow health innovators that are in the trenches today that are listening to this episode? Well, well, thanks for that. Uh, you know, I, I think the biggest thing I would say is, and, and I'll go back to choose a choose a an important uh, clinical problem that you can solve. Yeah. Um, a clinical problem that you know has an unmet need um, that the quote traditional healthcare system can appreciate, right? Um, mm-hmm. Doctors, nurses, hospitals, and all that. So, um, and 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 think about flipping it such that it's not a technology that precedes it. It's really a clinical problem that is being supported by technology. And so, that would be my my mantra. Um, yeah. And, um, and and that requires uh, that requires some deep thought in terms of uh, of, of the problem and the, and the approach. So that's that's kind of it. Well, thank and you so much. In, and hang in there. I mean, you know, I mean, things look grim sometimes. Actually, on a daily basis, on, on a millisecond basis. <laughs> Hang in there. It's always good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's why we're here to in- share strategy, share tactics, and and encourage our listeners to hang in there. Yeah. Um, that uh, you know we need folks to hang in there because we need to change our a, a lot that happens in healthcare today um, for for everyone's benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank so, you. It's been fun. Yes. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our listeners today. I have really enjoyed the conversation. What is the best way for folks to be able to get a, uh, a hold of you in case they've got some questions or want to find more about what's going on with you sure. and Vivante? Yeah. yeah. I mean, certainly they go to our website, which is, you know, VivanteHealth.com and, and um, see what we do. Um, I have no issue with handing out my, uh, my uh, email. It would be Angelitis A-N-G-E-L-I-D-E-S at Vivante Health, V-I-V-A-N-T-E-H-E-A-L-T-H.com. So just drop me a note, um, connect on LinkedIn if you'd like. Um, I'm always, always willing and welcome, and I love to hear from other folks who uh, want to just talk about building a business. That's great. Thank you so much. Pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Roxy. What's the difference between launching and commercializing a healthcare innovation? Many people will launch a new product, few will commercialize it. To learn the difference between launch and commercialization and to watch past episodes of the show, head to our video show page at drroxy.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show. You can subscribe to the latest episodes on your favorite podcast app 
like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or subscribe to the video episodes on our YouTube channel. No matter the platform, just search COIQ with Dr. Roxy. Until next time, let's raise our COIQ.